Punishment is something that fools mock. They mock punishment. They mock God's pu that God is a judge. They mock that idea. That's what a fool does. That 2 Peter 3, verse 4, starting there, they say, Where is the promise of His coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. That's not a, they're not asking a legitimate question of wanting to know the answer, wanting to know, well, why has God delayed this? That's not what's going on. It's a mocking. It's, it's just a sarcasm. I'm saying, where is this promise? They mock it, thinking it's never going to happen. But Peter says, in verse 5, for when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God that heavens existed long ago and that the earth was formed out of water and by water, through which the world at that time was destroyed, be, being flooded with water. But by his word, the present heavens and earth are being preserved by fi for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that without that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away, where the roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up. See, a fool, just like the Bible says, a fool will say in his heart, there is no God. That's a fool. A fool mocks God's, that God's going to punish. A fool mocks God's existence. When Romans clearly says that God has made it evident by His creation. And then also, a fool mocks his, God's punishment when they should look, you have evidence of the flood all over the world. Cat cat catastrophe. But yet the fool mocks that. The fool, the fool looks at the layers, that all these different layers, they're not even perfectly laid out at, at times. There's some stuff that goes right through, that there's trees that go, that are petrified, that go right through some of these layers. And it could not be any other way than that which actually are the burial later layers of the flood. That the layers that you see that scientists say that this is evolution and these fossils and you have this some order. They, it's not like they say it is. But the, this is what got buried in the flood is that all these layers are the sediment and the animals that got trapped in that sediment. You have the evidence right there. You go to the Grand Canyon, you, ha you can see all these, the layers that, 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 that the Grand Canyon is evidence from the flood because that actually was carved out after the flood, but because the world had, had changed so much, it was carved out by, as the earth is settling and, and some da natural dams broke way of some lakes, it carved out that Grand Canyon in a matter of a short time. And you see those, those layers Caves, caves that my family like to go on, that we've been the last couple of summers that we went to these caves that are the found uh, uh, even in Ohio. Those are carved out by the flood, the caverns, and the effects after the flood as well. You see that God's judgment, that the fool mocks those things. And even when I used the example before of that uh, Port Royal, 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 in the in the 17th, I think it was the 16th century. I believe it was in the 1500s when a great earthquake happened and people were swallowed up, and the town went into the ocean. There was multiple and the aftershocks and how one man actually prayed the Lord and was thrown out in one of those aftershocks. So the earth opened back up for him and threw him out, and that town was a wicked city. And people saw that as a judgment of God. So you have examples uh, of these things. Sodom and Gomorrah stands as a testament to all who want to go that way. 
that as a warning. And then even I think about those two hurricanes that for the first time, I, I don't know if it's ever happened anywhere in the world, but at least I know it's never happened in the U.S., that two hurricanes may hit about the same time. It makes me think of the beginning, the birth pangs, that of God's judgment as a warning. Even this whole year makes me think of that, of all the stuff going on of, of the locusts for the third time at least in Africa and different, different diseases and, and stuff going on and, and rumors of wars. And, but the fool mocks these things as if God is not going to judge when he really is. And they need to take warning seriously. Because God will. You know, I, I pose this question as a title that I could have had it multiple ways. Will God really punish the wicked? Or will God really punish sin? Or does God, as I put here, does God really punish evildoers? Yes, He does. The answer is yes. There's the eternal consequences found in Proverbs of being a fool. There's consequences. It's not as if one can choose be going away from God, going their own direction, and there's no consequences. Just as I t struck my children that, yeah, you may have chosen to do this, but you're not in control of the consequences that happen. That's even true in our own lives, that we may choose to do our own way, but we're not in control of, of, what, of the consequences that happen. It's the Lord that brings those. But verse 10 of Proverbs 15, Grievous punishment is for him who forsakes the way. He who hates reproof will die. Notice that this isn't one of these Proverbs is a contrast. The fool is like this, God's people is like this. This one says... Grievous punishment for, is for him who forsakes the way and then intensifies it with, he who hates reproof will die. That phrase, for him who forsakes the way, that, phrase, that way refers to the direction of one's life. That's used through all the script, throughout the Word of God, especially the Old Testament way or path is another, is another synonym for that. But it refers to the direction of one's life because there's two paths, there's two ways, only two ways, only two paths that a person can walk or live according to. And Psalm 1 even illustrates that only two ways one can live, or for God or for a life of sin in Satan's kingdom. And so there's the one path, God's way, path of life the path of righteousness, walking in God's truth of the heart, the desires to honor Him, true religion. Build, and that, that, that's, just, uh, that's really a reminder from last week that because we talked about hypocrisy, that God hates outward religion. He hates that. It's a fool that goes to out with outward religion. And God knows the heart. And so it's really true, true inward religion, which will end up affecting the outward. They'll show up in the actions. But, and so that is one way one can live. Then there's the way of sin. There's the way of, of being a child in Satan's kingdom uh, under the wrath of God, living in sin and in wickedness. And that leads to destruction. And notice that this verse makes a promise. Those who forsake the way will be punished. Well, which way? Well, we know it cannot be the way that those who forsake the way of sin are going to be punished. Because those who forsake the way of sin is where we all were born into. And those of us who know Christ, we were that way before. And we repented and put our faith in Christ. Those who forsake that way and come to Christ will find life. No, it's those who forsake the way of God's ways and hates to be corrected, those will be ones who will die. Those are the ones who will be punished. Those who know what the truth is and walk away from it and re or reject it must be punished because just as Romans 3.23, the first half of that verse says, for the wages of sin is death. 
The wage of sin is death. And so sin must be punished. Otherwise God would not be a just God. And so this is one of the marks of a fool who hates to be corrected and forsakes the way. This is because he thinks that his way is the right way, that he knows what is best. He thinks that he knows better than God who is holy and righteous, who is all wise and all knowing, etc. And so he rejects God's ways, makes light of sin, when the reality is sin is awful. Because sin brings death. The wage of sin brings death. But he makes light of that. Any time that so, someone sins, it's awful. They are building upon the wrath that they will experience. And there are many different types of fools that, that a person can be. One of the worst is somebody who's apostate. fool. One who were especially were teachers like pastors, evangelists, who began to question the authority of God's word as truth, whether it be, is God's word really inspired? Is God's word really inerrant? Is only certain parts, that's where you get in trouble where you start saying only certain parts of God's word is inspired and the rest is not. But these people, they, they reject God's way. They no longer claim to believe or know what is true. But the irony is that those who are apostates still want to be an authoritative teacher for people. Especially now today, of we have the internet and social media. That they want, they're arrogant, they're proud, and they put their, their, their rejection of God all over that and try to be still some type of authority about God. When they, and so they're arrogant. They quickly fall into wicked sins. And the reality is that they're actually unmasked. They fell long ago before they came out publicly. They forsake their spouse, they for their wife, they forsake their children. And, and the thing is, is that quite a few of them go into, hom for some reason, go into homosexuality. It, 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 I, I do not, on un one hand, I do not understand that. Why? why these apostates go into that. But they do. And it's probably a judgment upon them from God. Because Romans 1 speaks of that. And so they mock sin, they mock God's word. I saw, I looked up one today just to see what he was doing, doing up to, and he was mocking hell and eternal punishment. But the reality is they reveal that they never saved to begin with. And they never believed the truth that Christ is the only one way of salvation. They never truly believed that. And that is one type of fool. Especially one who forsakes the way. Who, who by all appearances was on the way. But as First John speaks of, they, it's, you know, just to sum it up is, they, really, they went out from us because they really... We're not of us. And so fools, fools think they know better. They refuse to acknowledge sin. They refuse to acknowledge to come back to Christ and to be forgiven, or to come to Christ, I mean. And that is a, that is a mark of a fool. And though the fool questions the reality of sin, question the reality of God's word. God's word still is truth. God's word warns that those who go this way with a promise that he will punish sin. There are many proverbs which are general principles. 
Because there are, there's usually exceptions because we live in an upside down world. And, but when Christ returns, everything will be made right. This is not one of those general promises of that, you know, that <laughs> they will not die in their sins. No, this is a, this is a promise. We know that from because the rest of Scripture speak about that. He will punish. There are many warnings through the Bible. Proverbs 29.1 A man who hardens his neck after much reproof will suddenly be broken beyond remedy. The person who sins will die. Ezekiel 18.20 Even Romans 6.23 again For the wage of sin is death. So God warns them. And though God hates sin and warns them and promises that sin will be punished, He takes no pleasure in that they die. Ezekiel 8.23 Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather that then that he should turn away from his ways and live? Verse 32 For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone who dies, declares the Lord God. Therefore repent and live. He was speaking to Israel, to Judah, I mean. He takes no pleasure in that they're going... He, he has to punish sin. But he is not a vindictive God who, who is joyous that of when the Babylonians were going to come in and wipe them out. And that they would physically die and, and worse yet is spiritually die. God ne takes no, death, no pleasure in that, though he does punish sin. God delights in those who repent of their sins and turn to faith in Christ. That is what he delights in, that the fool would forsake his folly and come to Christ. And so while the fool rejects God's ways and will be punished unless he repents and comes to Christ, believers are not to respond like the fools do. The way of the believer is not so like that. Believers repent and turn from their sins. They see their sin is awful and heinous, and they see that God's word is truth and authoritative. Believers see the benefit of God's discipline, because that's what reproof is. A, a, a fool does not want to be told that he is in sin, and his ways are wrong. He will mock it. He does not love the one who does that. But God's people see the benefit. Though, it's hurt, though it hurts, Though it's painful. Hebrews 12, 11, All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. We see the benefits that God, that here that God, when He does discipline us, it's for our good. If we were to read that whole passage, it talks about He does that. The share in His, whole, the share in his holiness that so that we would be godly. And so consider your response to, to when God disciplines you. Not everything that bad that happens to us is discipline. There's times where there's trials. It comes. But however, we can know that when it's, we should do, when things happen and trials happen, we should do a lot of soul searching. Is there some sin that I have not acknowledged? And oftentimes the Holy Spirit will bring that up when we know that that's a discipline, that this happened and the Lord has convicted me of this sin. And so we've got to see to our response is that how do we respond? Do we repent? What's a response when another comes to you out of love because they're concerned of the direction you're going? Do you get angry? Do you reject it? Do you or do you consider what they say? Is this true what they're saying? And if it is, do you repent and forsake it? What is your response? It should never be of the way of the fool. And so the fool will find out that God's judgment, they're going to find out there's, con there, there's eternal consequences and that those eternal consequences are certain. Proverbs 15, 11, Sheol and Abaddon lie open for the Lord. How much more the hearts of men. Sheol is a place of dead. 
depending on the context in the Old Testament, it can refer to the grave. And a lot, it can refer to that, or a lot of times it refers to hell, where the unsaved go. See, you and I cannot see in the grave. We cannot even see in the cat. When that cast is closed, we can no longer see that person. And then it's lowered, and the vault's put, put it's lowered, and the vault lid is put on, and then you have six feet of dirt on top of that. We cannot see that. And neither can you see the people in hell right now. But you know who does? It's God. That's because He's omnipresent and om omniscient. He is everywhere at all times, and there's not a place He cannot be. And He also has perfect knowledge. He knows all things. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere. That's, he's omnipresent. And He knows all things. There's not a place that you cannot be that God is not. Psalm 139.8, If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. God sees everything. God doesn't need a flashlight like you and I do in the dark. And even then, we can only see just what the flashlight shows us. Or if we turn on a light, like the light switches, we turn these lights on here. Or we turn a lamp on. It only brightens up so much of the room. And we cannot see. But with God, darkness and light are the same to Him. He can see and know what is happening. Psalm 139, verse 12. Even as the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is, is as bright as the day, darkness and light are alike to you. God can see it all. Light and dark He sees. We can only see so far. But God sees everything. He sees in the dark. He sees in the grave. He sees in hell. And He can even see in the womb. My frame, in the same psalm, verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. That, the womb. That God sees and knows everything. And just a few verses previously in this chapter, you saw that the Lord is omnipresent and omniscient and sitting on His throne ready to punish evil and reward the righteous. The eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. Proverbs 15, verse 3. So in this chapter alone, we have two verses that speak of God's omniscience and, om and His omnipresence. And that one spoke of His, His sovereignty ready to judge. And so does this one as well. Because that's why God's judgment is certain. He is on His throne. He is a judge. He knows all things. There's nothing He does not know. Hell and the bad and the place of destructions lie open to God. He sees. Perfectly sees everyone there. Even though those places are... I know the lake of fire is described as a place of outer darkness. And as well as a lake of fire. And I imagine hell is probably very... It's probably a place of darkness too. And God, He sees perfectly. He sees the graves. He sees that with perfect knowledge. There's nothing he cannot see and does not know. How much more does he see people's heart? Because that's what the verse states. Sheol and Abad and lie open before the Lord. How much more the hearts of men? The answer to that is he perfectly knows the thoughts of every person. Every intent, every attitude, there's nothing that God doesn't know. He knows us better than we know ourselves. God knows the heart and thoughts of every person at the same time. S Jeremiah 17.10 I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Even to give each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Proverbs 21.2 Every man's way is right in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the heart. Hebrews 4.12 for the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. 
So God knows it all. He knows all these things. Yet there's those that think he does not. That God doesn't see me. That God doesn't know. That I can hide, my, I can hide this from him. But when a person says that, they're only fooling themselves. They're deceiving themselves. Because God does know, God sees, and God will punish. He's the perfect judge. He is the holy, just God who must punish. He knows it everything. And that's why he, he is omnipresent and omniscient, and that's why the judgment is very certain. He doesn't need to gather evidence like the police and prosecutors do. As we, ought, we, it, we see that, we hear of that there's an investigation going on. They're trying to catch the person. We don't know. We're gathering evidence. They come in at the crime scene and gather everything they can. Gather fingerprints, gather DNA, try to find the weapon if it's a murder if, or a bank robber. They try to find out who did it and try to gather evidence and try to hope it's enough to g secure a conviction. God doesn't need to do that. He doesn't need to do that at all. He already knows that. And he's not like them in that sometimes the wrong person is accused and put on trial. Those things happen because man is fallible. Man makes mistakes. But God never does. God knows everything if it is stamped on your forehead. He sees it right there and then. Or if it was just written on your clothing, he knows. He knows all things. He knows when you're outwardly religious, but your heart is far from Him. He knows, and one day the books will be opened. There will be a heavenly courtroom and a verdict will be passed. Unbelievers will be sentenced, and there will be no chance of parole. There's no chance of appeals. There's no chance of getting off for good behavior or having your sentence reduced for good behavior. It's a permanent sentence. Far different than what man can get in this earth. Sometimes people get evidence that proves that they were innocent and that, the that the, they got the wrong person, whether that was accidental or intentional. But that's not here. God will not make a mistake. He won't sentence the wrong person for the wrong thing. No, He knows everything. Revelation 20, 12 through 15. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, stand before the throne, and the book, and books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which are written in the books, according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown in the lake of fire. God's going to open the books up. And what everyone has done and said, and punished. And that's why a person's ju judgment is certain. Because God is not a fool. He is all-knowing. And here's the reason for God's judgment. It's hinted, really, it's hinted at verse... Ten, uh, verse 10, but this built, 12 built upon that. A scoffer does not love one who reproves him. He will not go to the wise. This goes back to that verse 10. Verse 10 promised pu death and punishment to the one who forsakes God's ways and hates to be punished. Verse 11, that is certain because God is all-knowing. And then here, their punishment is not because of just some, something they did ignorantly. No, they don't want to listen. They will not go to the wise and listen to them. This is because they're a scoffer. Someone who mocks, who laughs at and hates God and those who walk in His ways. This person will not humble themselves and will not turn from their sin. That's one of the reasons that in the new birth, the Holy Spirit must open 
the eyes of the spiritually blind and their minds to understand and believe. To repent. The scoffers, they don't love the one who corrects them. They hate the light. John 3.19, this is the judgment that the light has come in the world and men love the darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. They love sin. They love darkness. They love wickedness. They love evil and their ways. And they hate those who do what's right. They hate those who correct them. They won't, don't want to be told they're doing wrong. Now, while scoffers do not love the one who corrects them and hates the light, believers do. Believers love those who do, those painful first, because believers love those who help them. Believers love God's Word. Believers love the light. Proverbs 27, 6, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Robert Alden said this, a most accurate barometer of spiritual maturity is one's willingness to accept correction, criticism. The worst athletes, artists, or students, for instance, are the most resistant to criticism. The ones who accept it and act on it are achievers, the achievers, excellers, and winners. How much, and so how, you know, how much, do we resent the slightest attempts of others to give us advice? How often do we ra how often do we rationalize it away by thinking, he doesn't know what he's talking about? Or if she's so smart, why isn't she doing any better? How we accept correction is a, is a gauge to our spiritual life. And so we must be careful. We must be Accepting it, because for for our good, it is for that we would grow in godliness and holiness, that we would love the Lord and turn from sin. And so, God uses people to come to us, and we cannot hate them. We have to consider what they say, though it's painful. Nobody is like screaming out with excitement. Yeah, you you know that this is so great that what you told me, but it hurts. It's, it hits our pride. I don't think that we're doing anything wrong. But those wounds are what helpful. I mean, we would never think about that if we had a broken arm you know, we would never think that we would, we would go to the doctor. We would never think about not going to them or, if we, or when we get there say, you know what, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, my arm's not broken, it's fine. You know, I don't want you to set it. Because it or or I, don't, I know it's broken, but I don't want you to set it because it's going to hurt to put that bo bone back in place. No, people would welcome that. I mean, people who have surgeries, open heart surgeries, that they don't necessarily look forward to having their chest opened up and their heart operated on, but they know that they're going to feel better. They're going to do be They're going to get better. And so, how much more, if if a do if we would welcome a doctor? How much more so we should welcome the Word of God and the Holy Spirit and believers who love us enough to correct us. Because the mark of the fool is will not accept criticism. Will not go to the wise. Doesn't want to hear it. But the mark of God's people, they go to the wise. They go to God's Word. They're learning. I saw usually the hot dog shop here in town has a lot of good sayings on there. But they put up there this, I think it was it's either this week or last week I saw that it, um, it said that the wise don't need advice, but fools will not accept it. Well, only half that half that true. Wise people still need wisdom, and they grow in wisdom because nobody who is wise 
on this earth of people is, is omniscient. None of us has arrived to where we know all things. And so we still need to. And so that, this is a mark of, of maturity is that we accept criticism or reproof is another word to use. And as well as we go to the wise. The fools do not. And their judgment is certain unless they repent and turn from their ways and put their trust in Christ. And so we ought to pray for those who are unsaved. We, we need to take the gospel to them as well. And then pray that the Holy Spirit would open up their eyes. Because their judgment is certain. It's a reality. And our desire is not that anybody would perish. We want, we want people to come to Christ. And so we ought to take that light to a, to a world who is dying.